And thanks very much for joining me for a story that looks at Australia's wealthy and the business and the values of giving. Just this year, a number of wealthy Australian business people have made big multi-million dollar donations to education, science and so on. But despite this, we still lag well behind our overseas counterparts like, say, Britain and Canada, who pride themselves on their generous philanthropy. So in this program, we look at who is giving in Australia and why. When it comes to pitching in for charity, the average Aussie is among the most generous in the world. Thank you. Have a good day. Out of 153 countries, we're near the top of the list in giving time and money. But when it comes to the top end of town, it's a different story. wealthy are among the most reluctant givers in the world. We have a nation of Scrooges, of people who do not, at the high end, who do not feel it's their responsibility to help out. Australia is the lucky country. Some of us are much luckier than others. It's estimated as many as 15,000 Australians have a net worth of over $20 million. Daniel Petrie is one of them. But unlike most of his rich colleagues, this father of three gives generously to medical research, health and education. Carol and I founded the Petrie Foundation back in 2001. Uh, we've allocated more than 35% of our net wealth to philanthropy, which puts us, and I don't like trying to be a hero on it, so it bothers me a little bit. But I think in the Australian context, we would be probably one of the most philanthropic families in the country. Now, I don't say that in any way to have some brass band, because I'm a little sad, quite honestly, because there are people who've got a lot more than us that could give a lot more than that. Daniel, the son of Romanian war refugees, made his millions from technology. While working for Bill Gates at Microsoft, he came up with a marketing strategy that rocketed their office software to world brand leader, earning the company billions. If you want to get to the internet, you can do that through Microsoft Network. Or you... Working for Bill Gates was an extraordinary experience. And one of the things that he said on a plane flight from uh, Seattle to New York once, we were talking about philanthropy, and he said th that it's your responsibility to give to the community within which you've earned your money, not your choice. So that if you're successful, it's not a choice you, you make, it's a responsibility. It's a, you have to do it. And I thought that made so much sense to me. We're very successful with the Windows operating system platform. I guess 90% of PCs run it. And it's Through Microsoft, Daniel was propelled into the ranks of the super wealthy. But then a bombshell. His sister, his only sibling, was killed in a car crash. After the grief subsided, he took stock of his life. It made me think about, well, what would we put on my tombstone if I dropped off the twig? And what had occurred to me is that pretty much it would say, uh, you know, Vice President of Microsoft, hopefully soon to be Senior Vice President of Microsoft. And that was pretty much it. And I thought at that moment, that wasn't enough. That I wanted to say that I was a, a really good father, I was a good partner, I was a, a good and contributing member of the community. Thanks, Rob. Daniel was true to his vision. In 2000, he returned to Australia, spent more time with his family, and working mostly nine to five, kept kicking business goals. The internet is, is a, a cavalcade of opportunities for content and content services. As chairman of the Packers PBL Online, he oversaw the introduction of internet giant 9MSN. You have to really understand what this new medium is about and how important it is. Daniel's right at home with the wealthy movers and shakers. That is, until he asks them 
why they don't fulfil what he sees as their philanthropic duty. No, I'm not very popular. I don't get invited to many dinner parties with wealthy people because the, the, when wealthy people are asked this question about what don't they give, they'll say things like, I'm going to get, get to it, I'm busy on the work, or, you know, I pay my taxes and uh, the taxes should, you know, these are the excuses. And when I sit with them, I go, well, firstly, most of you don't pay your full taxes. You've all got structured tax havens, you know, so that's bullshit. Um, you say that it's up to the government. Well, the government can't do everything, you know. So I, I, I will sort of pick off the lame, <laughs> irrational excuses and then it becomes this sort of, you're just, you know, a heretic and, you know, you're this crazy guy. If many wealthy Australians have dropped the philanthropic ball, there are still some among the super rich, like Greg Poach, who take giving very seriously. Um, I wanted to do some things, uh, having been successful in business. In 1974, Greg Poach launched what would become one of Australia's biggest freight express companies. To get there, he took on and beat the price-fixing transport cartels of Maine Nicholas and TNT. We've never seen such blatant defiance of the law and massive ripping off of Australian customers as has happened in this cartel. In 2003, Greg sold his company for three quarters of a billion dollars. From small beginnings, Greg ended up at number 31 on Australia's richest 200 list. But it was his huge gift, establishing a purpose-built melanoma unit, that put him at the forefront of philanthropy. It was a $32 million gift deserving of a standing ovation. The low-profile donor, Greg Poach, clearly overcome by the recognition. I hope your example is noted by the Packers, the Lowys and the Pratts of this world, because you have set a new standard for generosity in this country. Greg's $32 million was one of the largest single-purpose bequests by a living Australian. There's a terrific opportunity for entrepreneurs to uh, invest in this area, to sponsor... There's a story behind every headline, and Greg Poachers is no exception. <laughs> Hard to cut. But the went hard to cut. Greg's story started with his old mate Reg Richardson, a retired property developer. We've been friends now for 40 years. 40 years, yeah. So we're both fired by the same company. Um, which gave us a terrific <laughs> bond. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Which we're very proud of, by the way. <laughs> and Reg has a lot of rich friends who he shamelessly uses to raise money for charity. I know a lot of people because I've been around for a long time and uh, I sort of suss them out. They wouldn't know that. Uh, I'm good humoured. You have to make them like you a little, otherwise I'll never give you a cent. Uh, and I just have a crack. I think Reg is a very dedicated uh, fundraiser for really good causes. And uh, he, he certainly got me on board, and I'm so glad. Reg Richardson is a committed Catholic with three great passions, art, philanthropy and footy. Even his spectacles are the colours of his beloved South Sydney Rabbitohs. And now because I raise money for charity, I'm told uh, by the marketing people, never lose your red and green glasses, Reg, you are now branded. Reg grew up poor, left school at 15, and along with wife Sally, went on to make their fortune from property development and other business ventures. They now own one of Australia's largest private art collections, 800 works. Along with picking fine art, they also pick rich candidates who might give to good causes. I actually sit down at night with Sally and say, this is what I want to do. Who do you think we can ask? 
And Sally's really good at saying, what about so-and-so you met there? What about so-and-so you met over at Clontarf the other day? He looked pretty wealthy. And, you know, we, we put a list down. We might get a list over the evening of about a dozen. And I'll give them all the crack. Uh, and that's sort of, we're a bit of a team like that. Uh, Sally's good at thinking up the names, and I'm not too bad at the ask. <laughs> I flee about then. And Sally flees. <laughs> I said, you watch me. <laughs> Reg struck philanthropic gold when he put the ask on Greg Poach. One of the things I have made Greg is an absolute superstar of philanthropy. <laughs> Reg's big asks have enabled him to source over 400 works of art for St Vincent's Public Hospital. He's also raised over $85 million for charity. An outstanding achievement, but no match, arguably, for the funds that could be raised if the wealthy gave more. I get quite angry about it and quite energised because, you know, for every day that goes past that some guys haven't allocated money, some kids died. Some kid in Africa has died of hunger or didn't get a malaria shot. Some indigenous kid didn't get breakfast at school. So it's meaningful. It's not like this sort of just funny money going around a monopoly board. For every day that money doesn't pour into the not-for-profit sector, real people suffer. A scholarship program underway at Sydney University's medical school is an example of philanthropy working for the public good. Uh, Smoke Free Mommy Tummy was an education and support program for the arts and sports. These students are working health professionals who've been selected from their mostly rural communities to do a one-year graduate diploma in Indigenous health. I came up with the health priority issue, so I, I went for smoking and pregnancy. The students are about to have a surprise visit from a private donor who's put up $10 million for research and development into Indigenous health. And that donor is... Once again, it's Greg Poach, ably assisted by Reg Richardson. I brought Greg Poach with me. As you probably know, he is the founder of the Poach Centre here at Sydney University. He gave them uh, $10 million to set up that centre, which is fantastic. We're really, really involved in it. And it was a nice story how he gave them the cheque. We were driving down City Road, trying to find a parking spot. We found one, got out of his little car, and I said, Greg, have you got the cheque? He said, no, oh, he got it. And then uh, he said, oh, I haven't drawn it yet. So he, he wrote, uh, Sydney University, $10 million. And then a big gust of wind came up and blew it. He was doing it. <laughs> and Greg and I, two 70-year-olds, are running down City Road chasing this check for, check for $10 million. <laughs> you weren't far behind. It's <laughs> <laughs> the only time he's ever out sprinted me. <laughs> How good was that? And then uh, afterwards he gave the same amount to Flinders University in Adelaide and last year 14 Indigenous students studied, uh, started to study Year One Medicine. How good is that? Makes you feel good. I congratulate you for what you're doing. Well, 40 of you can make a huge difference. And I take my hat off to you, even though I don't have a hat. <laughs> Reg also donates generously to Indigenous health. It was very moving. So what drives these men to be such committed philanthropists? Well, in my case, it's uh, in the main. My wife says that she has never been seen me so happy ever uh, and in the words of the Harry Chapin song her words not mine you finally like yourself and I thought it's a pretty nice and touching thing to say I just want to want these programs to roll ahead and for some some good things to come out of them uh, that's that's enough for me I think um, just people like yourself that don't, you know, donating money to the courses, you know, for us to study to, it's just the, it's just wonderful. Well, it's great that it's great that there's such a such an effort being made by the, by students. A young man came up and spoke to both of us, and he said, "Why are you two guys doing uh, what you're doing for my people?" And I said, "Because if we were your people, if we Greg and I were Indigenous, we'd be dead." 
that's why we're doing it, because it's unfair, unjust, and it shouldn't happen. He said, thank you, brother. It's pretty nice, isn't it? How are we going to address um, the, the smoking? If we do nothing, we're going to have... There are always going to be gaps between what charities can do and governments can do. And yet there are all these needs, whether it's Indigenous education or cancer research or dire hunger in Africa. If it's not us, the, the wealthier ones, who? Who does it? If we, if we, the wealthy of the world, step back and go, nah, not us. Nah, can't be bothered. Who does it? Nobody does it. And so kids die, cancer doesn't get solved. Um, even, you know, galleries don't get filled with art. Whatever it is, whatever your thing is, doesn't happen. And so I, I, I get quite agitated about the sense that there are these wealthy people with piles of money where some of that money is not helping their life at all. So it's not like I'm asking them to change their life and go from driving a Lamborghini to driving, you know, an old 1963 Corolla. No, they can keep the Lamborghini. It's not affecting your life. Just give some of it away to a cause that you care about. Not going to give it to my causes. You find one. And they still reject that, that concept. Yes, no, I wanted to talk to you about the documentary, I'm a Girl. Yes. It's, it's Deanne Weir, a lawyer, is an oasis in the Australian philanthropic desert. Well, that team's very happy with it. Um, no, we're hoping for she got an unexpected windfall in 2010 when Foxtel bought out Ostar, the company she was working for. Deanne and her husband immediately invested some of her cashed out shares in a philanthropic foundation. Well, look, we contributed two and a half million dollars into to set up the foundation, um, and uh, we've yes, in year one we've um, donated I think um, over three hundred thousand of that, and um, we'll probably do some more before the year's out. Deanne's foundation supports the arts and education, with a special focus on women's causes. So, Deanne, this is the Women and Girls Emergency Centre. This is the part of her three hundred thousand dollars worth of donations went to this Sydney refuge. Great. If you come through. Yes. Hello, Hello. Deanne. Great nice to see you, you. Deanne. We're Helen. Today, she's visiting for the first time to see how her money is being spent. This is Virginia. Hi, Virginia. I'm Deanne. This is Deanne. Great yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is Nice to meet you. Great. 47-year-old single yes. mother Virginia yes. came to the yeah. refuge after sleeping in a friend's mm. car for 18 months. Do you mind, do you mind if I ask, your, in terms of your circumstances, was it um, losing a job? That, that... Um, I've had chronic pain, migraines, yes. for like 25 years. Right. And bringing up my son by myself and creating my own businesses while all of that was going on. Yeah. And then, I, unfortunately, I met and got into a very bad situation. And now I'm not coping like I once was. Yes. It's very yes, humbling. It's Here like is clearly a very intelligent, way. articulate, um, lovely woman who could be your sister or your cousin, um, the lady down the street, who has faced these issues, um, you know, due to circumstance and, and illness. And... As a community, there's got to be an answer to that, the, and, and it has to be an answer beyond her sleeping in a friend's car. Nice stuff. Lucky to have a stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Deanne recognises her role is not to work in the refuge, but use her wealth to help keep it going. She sees philanthropy as an investment with genuine returns. Mm. Aid targeted at women and girls is almost twice as impactful as aid targeted more generally um, because, you know, women essentially end up spending around 90% of their income on their family and their community because it's more inherent in, in what they do. Targeted philanthropy, where the rich avoid red tape and use their business acumen, can produce real change. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for coming in. No, thank you. So, movement from uh, the blood pathology tissue to molecular. Exactly. I mean, this. Daniel's Petrie Foundation uh... helps fund breast cancer research at Sydney's Garvin Institute, a prestigious medical research facility. It's maybe 15% of patients have basal like breast cancer. That's a very aggressive one. 
in 2011, they had a significant breakthrough, identifying a way to shrink tumours and prevent breast cancer cells from spreading. And so the drugs that are being developed to treat breast cancers yeah. can potentially now be used to treat pancreatic cancer. How do you think about that? How do you, how do you but think had Daniel not used his business know-how, it's a great question. Um, his two million dollar donation might have been wasted. And I started to look at breast cancer research in Australia and what I found sadly was that a lot of breast cancer research in Australia shouldn't be funded. They shouldn't be given oxygen. It's they're not they're bad people, they're good people, but they're not they're not doing research that's moving the dial. It should be part of the process of giving is working out whether this person or organisation you're going to fund has a chance of moving the dial. As well as funding breast and prostate cancer research, Daniel's Petrie Foundation also hired Swinburne and Queensland universities to investigate why Australia's wealthy give so little. Their research produced some disturbing results. I was horrified and shocked to find, no, there was... No one gave... Very few people gave money. If you look at the top list of our top philanthropists from Philanthropy Australia, they're all dead guys. They're all people with estates, either corporate estates or dead people estates. Not our, not our living, it was, it was terrible. Daniel points out that while other Western wealthy pay what he sees as their dues, donating around 10% of their net wealth, well-heeled Australians average less than 2%. It's beyond greed. It's beyond greed. It, it shows a completely corrupt value system. And people, you know, they love to step around this quietly, and, oh, you know, charities waste money, and Fred, he worked for his money, and all this. No, if, you know, Fred's got $100 million, he can give 20 of that into a foundation that can they give to causes he wants. If he doesn't, he is morally bankrupt. He does not take the responsibility of the society that he lives in. He takes all the benefits of the society, the financial systems that ensure that people pay their taxes and that people pay the invoices that he's issued, that he doesn't get stabbed on the street, etc., etc. Take all the benefits from that and give nothing back. He's morally bankrupt. So why are our wealthy such reluctant givers? It's said there are two certainties in life. Death and taxes. But for wealthy Australians, there is a loophole. In Britain, if you die rich, you pay tax on your wealth, unless you've bequeathed some of it to a charity. If you've given some of it away before you die, you can also avoid punitive death taxes. It's similar in the USA, but Australia abolished death duties over 30 years ago and Daniel Petrie believes that puts philanthropy off our agenda. Having death taxes changes the culture. And we don't have that here. We don't have estate taxes, which sort of force you to do the practical uh, decision of, well, give it away before the government takes it. And there's no social pressure on, on you to give. So my proposal is that we have an estate tax of 20% on wealth over $30 million. And you have two choices. If you decide not to allocate 20% of your wealth to your own foundation, which then gives to whoever you want to give, on your death, 20% of your wealth will be taken and put into an Australian philanthropic foundation. It won't go into government consolidated revenue. So in no way does the tax end up in the government's hands, which I think is important. And it only, you only get taxed if you have chosen not to give. Daniel's tax could raise $4 billion a year. But with no tax, it could mean that Australian philanthropy is destined to depend on a few kind men and women. Do you want me? We always want you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Today, Greg and Reg, along with wives Kay and Sally, are meeting for a working lunch. 
to arrange a charity fundraiser for melanoma research. What, what I would suggest is we'll have a five-star event. Five top restaurateurs, chefs. Yep. And we'll call it a five-star event. Yes. Something yep. like that. Yep. No trouble whatsoever. Let me organise the chefs and I'm sure and some of the... Top restaurateur Armando Percuoco already donates generously. He's hosted over 100 charity dinners at his own expense. Yeah. And we should make a couple of hundred thousand dollars out of that, you'd think, wouldn't you? Uh, if we can organise everything, listen, with uh, Starlight Foundation, we always done half a million dollars a night. You've got my sort of numbers Some there. nice artists <laughs> to, to uh, yeah. give us some Don't get him too excited. <laughs> It looks like melanoma research could get a half a million dollar boost it wouldn't otherwise have had. I, I just want to be behind, behind everybody and look after you. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh, he wants let the me head. Know. He oh, wants the head. Let me know. He's such a nice man, Amanda. Not me, uh, Amanda. <laughs> I think you clarified that. And he's a great man, Amanda. And the working lunch didn't stop there. This is how we rock and roll. I call it good. I call it bloody good. <laughs> nice, After we turned off our cameras, Reg had a private conversation with Greg. The result? Greg pledged another $30 million to Indigenous Health, bringing his total philanthropic donations to $105 million, placing the Poche family among Australia's most generous philanthropists. There is nothing um, extraordinary about either Greg or myself in, in this regard. It's simply that we, we believe in this. You know, you've got to give something back, haven't you? You really have to. Uh, it would be a tragedy to live a pre privileged, wealthy life without doing something good for other people. That really would be. So, here we are. I'll drink to that. Yeah, well, honey, Cheers. that's so true. I'll drink to anything. There we go. Next on Compass. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Not in my wildest dreams would I ever have imagined I would leave law to become a fashion designer. A new breed of young fashion designers is turning heads on the Australian catwalk. I'm a Muslim woman and I like to dress very um, fashionably. They're making their mark with cutting edge designs that appeal to the fashion conscious. You don't need to expose everything to be beautiful. Fashion and faith, Muslim style. That's next week on Compass. I'll see you then. <laughs>